So when I graduated high school, I received as a gift a collection of essays by philosopher Peter Singer. And I'm really excited that we'll get a chance to hear from him later today. So Singer's essays cover topics like euthanasia, abortion, animal rights, our duties to the poor and the hungry. I really agreed with much of what I read, but what really struck me was that in cases where I disagreed, I often couldn't say why. And I wondered, where did these intuitions of mine come from? So in college, I decided to major in philosophy to grapple with questions of right and wrong, and also perhaps a little bit to develop the smarts and the skills to argue the case for some of the intuitions I already had. Today, though, I'm going to come back to a version of that other questions. Where do our intuitions come from? So I'll speak to you from a different perspective as a psychologist and a neuroscientist. Instead of taking on the philosophical challenge of figuring out what actually is right and wrong, I'm going to tell you about how, in our minds and brains, we do it. How do we make moral judgments? Well, things get complicated pretty quickly. Like I said from the beginning, our moral psychology is full of disagreement and full of dilemmas. This is, again, part of what makes moral psychology so interesting and important. Right, but this also poses a dilemma for the moral psychologist. If we want to figure out the moral mind, whose mind are we going to study? I suggest that one way into this problem is to study a rule that might apply independent of any specific content, of any specific moral norm. So even if I don't know what you, sir, think is morally wrong, I know that, to your mind, whatever that wrong thing is will be more wrong when it's done intentionally than accidentally. So in the law, for instance, this is the difference between murder and manslaughter. Let me say more about this distinction. And I'll illustrate this with a case study. So a few years back, former US Vice President Dick Cheney shot this man, Mr. Harry Whittington, with birdshot pellets. Cheney thought he was shooting at quail and not his buddy. But here's what the victim had to say. Accidents do and will happen. And in fact, he goes on to offer his own sort of apology. My family and I are deeply sorry for everything Vice President Cheney and his family have had to deal with. What I want to know is what's going on in this man's mind that allows him to say something like this and actually mean it? What psychological and neurological mechanisms allow him to offer his friend forgiveness? Indeed, maintaining relations with our friends and family requires that we consider not just the outcomes of people's actions, but also their true intentions. This capacity that we have for thinking about other people's intentions is called theory of mind. So what I want to talk about today is how we do this when navigating our social and moral environment. But I'm also going to talk about when mental states matter very little for our moral judgments and why that is and what that tells us. So I'm going to talk about three things. When and how mental states matter for moral judgments, when they don't, and why. OK, so like I said, we care a lot about what a person means to do. So if this character here thinks the powder before her is poison, even though it's just sugar, what will happen if she takes some of that powder and puts it in someone's drink? Well, nothing, right? Nothing bad will happen, because after all, the powder is sugar, not poison. So then how many of you think that, therefore, this is OK, that this is morally permissible? No harm, no foul. That's right. This is a failed murder attempt, so it's not at all morally permissible. Now, what if this time the powder actually is poison but gets mistaken for sugar? Well, innocent intentions count, too, just like they did for Cheney. And so when people cause harm by accident without meaning to, we forgive them, or at least we try. So recent work that we've done suggests that specific brain regions help us both blame people when they attempt to cause harm but fail, and also forgive people when they cause harm by accident. By scanning people's brains while they make moral judgments, we've been able to characterize how one brain region in particular accomplishes this. This region is right above and behind your right ear. It's the right temporoparietal junction, or RTPJ. So the level of neural activity in this region is high when people are reading about morally relevant beliefs and intentions, and response is low when people are reading about other facts of the situation, like whether the powder is sugar or poison, for instance. 
Now, it's one thing to know that this brain region is selectively activated when people are reading about the innocent and guilty intentions of other people, but what we'd really like to know is whether the level of activity in this region is predictive of the kinds of moral judgments people actually make. So for instance, what's going on in our, in our minds and brains when we decide to forgive this character here for accidentally poisoning her friend? What's going on in the RTPJ? What I'm showing you here is the relationship between RTPJ activity and the moral judgments people actually make. So people with a high response in this region are able to be more forgiving of somebody for causing an accident because they focus more on what's going on up here, the innocent intention. Meanwhile, people with a low response in this region don't focus as much on what's up here, but rather they focus more on the harmful outcome. So they're less forgiving and they assign more blame. Now here we have a correlational relationship between the RTPJ and people's judgments of blame and forgiveness. But ideally, we could modulate activity in this region, that is change activity in this region, and then observe subsequent changes in people's moral judgments. We actually have this kind of technology. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. So this technology actually al allows us to selectively disrupt activity in specific parts of people's brains. More specifically, TMS allows us to induce a current in the brain by passing a magnetic field through the scalp and the skull, resulting in what we call a virtual lesion. So what happens when we do this? What happens when we disrupt activity in the RTPJ? It turns out that people assign more blame for an accident, focusing more on the outcome rather than the intent, and people also deliver less blame for a failed attempt to harm. After all, nothing bad actually happened. So what's going on up here in the mind matters less. So what these results show us is that disrupting activity in this region disrupts people's ability to think about other people's intentions, and that leads them to deliver moral judgments that are based more on the outcome. Now we've taken this task recently to other populations too, and I'm gonna tell you about two today. So one group has deficits in theory of mind, thinking about other people's intentions. These are individuals with autism. A second group has deficits in emotional empathy, appreciating the emotional experience of moral victims. These are individuals with a clinical diagnosis of psychopathy. So first, autism. The individuals that we tested with autism delivered especially harsh moral judgments of accidents. They focused more on the outcome and less on the innocent intention. But perhaps how much we forgive an accident depends not just on turning up the dial on mental state reasoning, but also turning down the dial on our gut emotional responses to a bad outcome, to the pain and suffering of the victim. So like I said, we took this task to psychopaths. Uh, these were folks in a medium security prison in Wisconsin where we handed out our paper and pencil surveys to inmates. So how did these folks do? Individuals with psychopaths were especially lenient on accidents. They focused only on the intention and not very much at all on the fact that somebody was hurt. So they treated accidentally poisoning your friend here as practically no different from going out and picking flowers. So what I've shown you so far suggests that mental states matter a great deal for our moral judgments. And I focus so far on actions that harm other people, like poisoning them or shooting them. And indeed, in paradigmatic cases of harm, at least one person harms at least one other person. The victim may demand an explanation from the perpetrator who might appeal to his innocent intent. And so intent allows us to both explain and evaluate past actions and to, really importantly, predict people's future actions. So if someone caused me harm by accident rather than on purpose, they're less likely to do it again in the future. So reasoning about people's intentions is really important in these interpersonal contexts where one person's actions affect another. But now, I'm also going to talk about when mental states matter very little for our moral judgments. So this up here is Tony Washington, would-be draftee for the NFL, the National Football League. Last year, Washington had high hopes. His national grade suggested that he'd be a second-round pick, at least. But when the seventh round rolled by and the last pick was called, 
Washington wasn't even drafted. Why? Well, Washington was guilty of committing incest. He'd slept with his biological sister, and this is illegal in all 50 states. So in his case, the act was consensual and nobody was hurt, but even so, nobody seemed to want him on their team. It was as though his character had been contaminated all those years back. Taboo violations, like incest and even eating taboo foods, like dog meat or horse meat in some cultures, are often deemed morally offensive, but not because they cause harm to victims. Often there are no victims. So consensual incest and taboo food consumption directly affect only the people who participate in the act, the people who sleep with their relatives, the people who eat the forbidden foods. And even when we think about doing these things accidentally, they still seem wrong. They still seem to render people morally impure. So it's possible that evaluating taboos depends not so much on what people mean to do, but on what they actually do. So to test this hypothesis, we presented subjects with harms and taboos that were either intentional or accidental, and we collected people's moral judgments of these cases. And again, what we found was that intent mattered a great deal for people's moral judgments of harmful actions. As you can see, subjects saw a big difference between intentionally and accidentally hurting someone. But intent mattered very little in people's judgments of taboos. People saw a much smaller difference between intentionally and accidentally committing taboo violations like incest. So these behavioral data suggest that intent matters very differently for different kinds of moral judgments. Is there evidence in the brain for this? So if it's the case that harmful actions elicit more attention to people's mental states like their intentions, we should expect to see more activity in brain regions that help us do this, that help us reason about people's intentions for harms over taboos. And that's exactly the pattern that we find. So I've shown you so far that mental states matter a lot for harms and matter much less for taboo violations. But why is this and what can this tell us? So rules against incest and eating taboo foods may have evolved for our own good to protect ourselves from possible contamination. And when we're worried about negatively impacting ourselves, we may care less about whether that impact was intentional or accidental. The key is just to avoid the contamination or the bad outcome. By contrast, harm norms may have evolved to limit our negative impact on each other. So especially in the case of accidents, it's really important that I know what the person is thinking in order that I can make predictions about their future behavior and also accurate identification of friends and foes. So when we must interpret or evaluate another person's actions, we really need to know what's going on inside. What are they thinking? But it's not often that we have to evaluate or interpret our own actions. So what I'm suggesting is that mental state reasoning allows us, above all, to make sense of other moral agents, to explain and predict their actions, and also, perhaps most importantly, to evaluate the people around us as our potential social partners. So does any of this help us solve the problems of moral philosophy? Again, what I've shown you is that moral judgments depend on specific brain regions for helping us think about other people's intentions. Intentions and mental states in general are really important for the moral judgments that we make. Nevertheless, different people rely differently on this process. So as we saw, some people are more forgiving than others of accidents. Different moral norms also rely differently on this process. Intent matters more for harms than they do for taboos. And indeed, different people across different cultures may disagree about whether an act is right or wrong, why it's wrong, and even whether the primary issue is a moral one. So the science of morality may not solve the problem of moral disagreement, but it might help us understand its origins. And that, I think, is a really great place to start. Thank you.